Father, you do indeed have the power to save. That power to save was granted to us in your son as he went to a cross in place of everybody who would believe in him. I pray, Father, that you would grant us your grace right now to behold him, to understand him rightly through the writing of your word. So, Lord, we ask that your spirit would attend to us and give us eyes and ears to see your son for who he is. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. As we come to our time around the Lord's table today, we're going to be looking at a passage that reveals to us why Jesus has the right to regain the glory, the glory that he laid aside when he came to this earth. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to John chapter 17? If you don't have a Bible, there are some men who are going to be coming down the aisles. Just raise your hand and they will get a copy of God's word to you. If you don't actually own a Bible or have access to a Bible, we would love for you to keep this as a gift from us. And the reason why we would love for that to be the case is so that you could begin reading God's word for yourself. The setting in John 17 is that Jesus has just finished celebrating the Passover with his disciples. He's told them that he's leaving this world and his disciples are filled with grief as they contemplate the prospect of living the rest of their lives without him, their master. And this is just before they enter into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus knows that he's going to be turned over to the Jews and he's going to be tried and he's going to be crucified. And he knows that that is going to be very, very hard for the disciples. So when he prays, he lifts before the Father, the disciples, and he prays for them. And he prays a lot of things for them. Things that will give the, the disciples an idea of the, the plans that he and the Father have together for them. The plans in this world and the plans in the age to come. But Jesus knows that what the disciples need the most is a right understanding of his nature. And that has everything to do with his glory. And the glory that he shared with the Father before the world began. And the glory that the disciples will behold when they join him in heaven. And that's what's on Jesus' mind as he begins praying. So as we look at our passage today, let's notice two things in our passage. These are two reasons for Jesus regaining the glory that he once had. And those two things are who Jesus is and what he did. So let's read verses 1 and 2 together from John 17. Jesus spoke these things, and these things are the four chapters that precede this, the things he shared with them in the upper room during the Passover about his departure and about the Spirit and about the Father. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So let's look at how Jesus declares and explains who he is in this passage. He identifies himself as the Father's own Son. He says, glorify your Son. Jesus is telling the disciples that he is the begotten one of God. He is identical in composition to the Father. And that he represents the Father's divine nature exactly. That's what he tells them about him. But he's also telling him that telling the disciples that he is the son. He is the only son. You see the definite article there. And Jesus is telling the disciples that he is unique in that regard. He's very unique. Nobody else can claim this. Not a single soul can claim that they are the son of God. And because of that, it is right for Jesus to regain the glory that he had with the Father. He is the one man and the only man who possesses a divine nature. But Jesus explains more of who he is at the beginning of verse 2. We see that where he speaks about his authority. He says, you have given him authority over all flesh. The authority that Jesus is talking about there is the power that Jesus will one day have when he rules over this earth. The power that he has. He will rule in righteousness and in peace. And it's because Jesus has this authority, it's because he has this power, that he has the right to regain his glory that he once had. So Jesus is worthy to regain the glory that he once had because of who he is. But he's also worthy of regaining that glory because of what he did. And we see that in the middle of verse 2. 
The second reason that Jesus deserves to regain his glory is because of what he will do. He says, you have granted him authority over all flesh that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. He might give eternal life to those that the Father has given him. Before the foundation of the world, the Father gave a subset, a subset of all of sinful humanity to Jesus. And this subset is the same people to whom the Father would give the faith to believe that they need a Savior from their sin, and that Jesus himself is that Savior. And the Father entrusted those people into Jesus' care, and it was Jesus' task to give them eternal life, to purchase eternal life for them. This prayer doesn't explain how Jesus actually purchases eternal life for them, but the next two chapters do. When you read John 18 and you read John 19, you see that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. You see that he was turned over to the Jews where they tried him unjustly. They convicted him unjustly. He was taken to Pilate. Pilate didn't know what to do with him. Pilate scourged him. Pilate knew he was innocent, but Pilate turned him over to the Jews. And the Jews took him and they put a beam across his shoulders and they made him walk outside of Jerusalem to a place on a hill. And the soldiers laid him down on that beam and they nailed his hands to the beam. And then they lifted that beam up and they attached it to a post that was already in the ground. And then they nailed his feet to that same post. And Mark's gospel tells us that Jesus hung there for six hours. He hung there for a reason. He was accomplishing something. He was purchasing something. And what he was purchasing was the salvation of everybody that this passage describes, everybody that the Father had given to him. The Father knew clearly and understood everything that every one of those people had ever done that would offend him. People who lived before Christ and looked forward to him as their Messiah. People who lived contemporary to Christ and looked at him as their Messiah, their Savior, their Lord, and their Master. As well as people like us who look back at him in the church age and recognize that he is indeed the Savior. He's the Savior that we need. The Father took the sin of all of those people and placed it on Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his body. He actually bore them in his body. And the Father did an accounting, and he took all of the sin of those people, and he measured the offense that it was against him. And he found that offense to be infinite. And he knew that all of those that he had given to the Son would never be able to atone for that offense themselves. He knew that the response of a holy God, his only right and just response to that infinite offense was an infinite punishment, one that people could never bear in a finite period of time. So he sent his son, and he put his son on a cross for six hours. And he hung there from the third hour until the ninth hour. And what Jesus did was he absorbed in his own body the outpouring of God's wrath against all of those people that the Father gave to the Son. And Jesus, because he's not one of us, he's a man who represents us, but he was truly God, as this passage tells us in verses 1 and 2. He was fully God, and he was capable of actually absorbing all of that wrath in a finite period of time. So that is what Jesus did. He, he saved those. He purchased salvation for all of those who would recognize him as his Savior and their Lord. And it's because of that that Jesus is worthy to receive the glory that he once had before he came into this world together with the Father. So we want to remember Jesus that way this morning. If you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior and Lord, would you please remember Jesus this way as the one who was the only Son of God, who was indeed divine, who was indeed qualified to take your place because he was a man and he was God. But remember what he did is that he absorbed in his body something that we could never absorb in an infinite period of time. And he actually purchased salvation for us after being given the responsibility to do that by the Father. So when the elements come to you, take and hold them and ponder these things. And when your heart is ready, Take the elements on your own. If you're here today and Jesus is not your Lord, he's not your master, you don't recognize these things about Jesus, that he is the son of God. He was God in the flesh when he was here. He is God today as he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. If you're one of those people, I want to encourage you to understand something. And that is that this time is a time for believers. It's a time for Christians to remember what God has done for them. But it's a good time for you to ponder who Jesus really is. As the elements are being distributed, take them and, and consider what it is that Christ has done, what he has done for all of those who would call upon him. 
The following verse is a really good verse where it explains to us what a person does who understands who Christ really is. You look at verse 3, and Jesus says, this is what eternal life is. Eternal life is that you know God, and you know Jesus Christ whom he sent. And the knowing there is, is not a knowing of information. It's not a knowing of facts. It's a personal knowing, and it's an intimate knowledge. The best way to look at that is to know Christ that way, is, is to know Christ in the same way that you know yourself. You know what your affections are. You know what your inclinations are. You know what your desires are. You know yourself intimately. You know yourself much better than just your height and your weight and your hair color and your eye color. It's to know him intimately. And any one of the elders, myself included, would love to explain to you after the service what it is like to know Christ intimately. So men, come and serve us. When those are ready, take the elements on your own. I'll be back to pray.